story. I want the inside dope on this guy. I tell you, boys and girls, whichever one of you gets it out of him is going to wind up with the single most important interview since God talked to Moses. As a child, I, I perceived that what happened in comic books was well beyond the scope of anything that you would ever see in a live action movie. And that, of course, was part of the appeal of comic books. You see anything you could draw, and of course you can draw anything that you want to draw, but you can't film anything that you want. You have to film something that's happening. I think Geek Nation really sort of emerged in the 70s when it became possible to take all of those things that you had seen in comic books and slap them up there on a, a, a movie screen and watch them happen. An interesting thing starts to happen in the 70s where you get the people who are becoming the filmmakers grew up on the fantasy stuff of the 50s. This was something that sparked their imaginations when they were kids, and then they wanted to capture that and bring that back and tell those stories in a way that modern audiences would appreciate it. I think there was a paradigm shift, and I think it was a good thing, and it allowed for more complex programs of pictures. I did all the Kubrick films during that time, Clockwork, etc. The Towering Inferno, which was another one of those great big things, and then we did The Exorcist and Superman, ultimately. That fundamental change that happened uh, was really evidence first by Jaws. It was the first film that was a blockbuster type of release with blockbuster expectations and with a superstar celebrated property. After that, companies began to look for those films that would reframe their company, it would reframe the expectation of what their film slate could be. And everybody said, get me one of those. Probably most trends are, are upon us before we realize they're there. By the time we pick it up as a kind of a trend, even if it's something we're contributing to, I would expand that thought to Star Wars itself, which I suppose set its own trend. At the moment of, of the creation of these things, I don't think anyone would have predicted the kind of reach that it would have, and therefore uh, that it would ever be defined by the term trend. Say, Jim! Woo! Excuse me. That's a bad I think one of the great things that I don't see as much in the movie business now as I used to see, and it was both good and bad in the old days, but you don't see the pirates anymore. You don't see those people who would take gigantic risks with some of their own money and a lot of other people's money. Where it came from, I don't want to know, okay? But, I mean, whatever it took the Salkin, the, these people from Europe to find Superman, and then decide to make an epic movie about Superman in two parts. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what got them to that decision, but it was a brilliant idea. My father, Alexander Salkai, was an absolute wizard. Really had this extraordinary talent to find money. And also, he had an incredible charm in a, in a different way, but, but you know, he would hypnotize people, literally. I had very blue eyes, and I would just look at them, and hypnotize them, and they would give checks. I've tried, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The Salkinds came to us and wanted a distribution deal, and as I recall it, we ended up with U.S. distribution rights only at that time. The negotiations were impossibly complicated and very difficult, and Salkind was very bright, but very difficult, and so were we. It was a time of desperate characters. And they made movies with a kind of ferocity and energy and fury that's not possible with large corporations. We were finishing The Four Musketeers. Ilya 
came up with the idea, actually. I said, hey, what about doing Superman, the comic book, as a, as a film? So I said, well, it's going to be expensive. And then suddenly I said to my father, let's do Superman. I said, it's known, this, uh, the, the Superman. I said, it's known? It's as known as, as Jesus Christ. It's, everybody knows Superman. So he went to talk to his backers, and they all reacted well. And then, okay, we said, yeah, let's do it. Then we proceeded with uh, looking on how to secure the rights. In August of 74, a representative of DC Comics flew in to London. That was a gentleman called Bernard Cashton. The key for DC Comics was, uh, and actually there is a clause in the contract, which is called integrity of character. The arrangements for the first couple of Superman movies were a very exhaustive contract with us all kinds, where DC was really trying to look at every possible issue of production and take a very aggressive point of view of the quality of the production, the standards, and really to be as fully involved as possible to make sure that it would be a great set of films. That was a very daring idea at the time. There had not been a comic book movie prior to Superman other than this, the serials in, in theaters in, really in the late 40s. There, of course, have been television shows, the Superman TV show, but to do a big budget Hollywood film of a comic book character, that was thinking in a way people really hadn't done previously. And in that sense, the Salkines were very pioneering. DC Comics had absolute control on everything that was done. Uh, of course, who would play Superman? They approved Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali. They approved Dustin Hoffman. They approved Al Pacino. They approved Jimmy Kahn. They approved Steve McQueen, uh, Clint Eastwood. It was a smorgasbord, you know, a, a real mix. Some of it, when you look back in retrospect, it's kind of funny because you have the approved list of actors who could play Superman or Lois and included most of the stars of the day, including some who probably should never have been in those roles, but just had enough box office appeal, I guess, at the time to technically count as approved. That's when, of course, things start to move in, let's say, the Alexander and Ilya way, where we started seeing things bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So we started William Goldman to write the screenplay. And uh, after three hours, he said, uh, look, guys, I just don't see it. And very nicely we parted. So then, of course, my father, who had already raised some money, of course he was getting nervous. He said, so, so what, what? We, uh, so I, I uh, Mario Puzzo. Yeah, Godfather. Oh, okay, let's take Mario Puzzo. Mario comes in, talks like that, slow, smoke big cigars, Italian a bit, you know, like that. And, and, and so we talk, and, blah, blah. and he says, I like it. And it was interesting because he went, spent a few uh, few days uh, at DC Comics with the editors there and uh, sort of looked a bit at their archives and immediately picked a few things that he thought would be very cinematic. So the elements of Mario Puzo that stayed in the movies are the use of Krypton, the use of the Fortress of Solitude. I mean, it seems like evident, but in fact, there are so many things in the comic book that you could have done. That was a 500-page script. It was gigantic, it was extraordinary, it was an absolute saga, and definitely two movies. We had talked about that since the beginning, right, with Mario. Very strong, I mean, very solid, the construction. It's Mario Puzo, it's a good writer. And then, of course, uh, the director story came up, right? I mean, I don't know, every director under the sun was considered. I think we approached Friedkin, uh, we approached, definitely Peter Yates was very interested. We approached John Guilliman, who was very interested. I had a meeting with Sam Peckinpah. This is a very interesting meeting because uh, I think it almost got to a point where a gun appeared or something. Anyway, we did not do it. <laughs> then I come up with the idea, Guy Hamilton, Goldfinger, Bond. Uh, and I say to my father, okay, what about Guy Hamilton, Puzo, Guy Hamilton, Bond, Godfather? Yeah, that sells, because I would adapt myself to the mentality of the buyers. Then Mary did two drafts and then said, fellows, that's it for me. I, I, I've, I think I've given what I can. I cannot do any more. This is when Guy 
insisted that we needed a further rewrite. Uh, and this is when we approached to the Newmans and Benton. We got a call from the Salkins, and they said they had this, they wanted to do a, a film, a two-part film about Superman, and that they had this large novella script by Puzo, and they would like us to adapt it. And so we agreed that David and I would write the first draft and one revision, and then David and Leslie would take over from there and write the subsequent drafts. You know, a couple of friends said, why would you want to do that, a comic book, blah, blah, blah. And David's answer was, Superman is our King Arthur. This is our legend. This is our, our version of pulling the sword out of the rock. And that when you looked at it, it had as much to offer as King Arthur. Who are you? A friend. The battle to have an unknown or have a star, that was the hardest battle of all because, of course, my father was absolutely screaming, you got to get a star to play Superman. So at that point, I said, OK, well, I'm going to offer it to Robert Redford. And he read it, and, and, and he wrote me a very nice letter saying, I'm sorry, I, I don't think I can do it. I then offered it to Paul Newman, and then I said, let's offer him the three parts, jor Superman, and Lex Luthor. After Newman said no, then I said to my father, look, let's forget Superman. We're never going to get a Superman that really works at this point. I said, well, let's get a huge star for, for jor -El and a huge star for, for Lex Luthor. We had tried to get Dustin Hoffman to play Lex Luthor. He was interested, but eh, eh, I can't remember. Didn't work out. And then this agent, Kurt Frings, calls me, and he says, Ilya, Ilya, I can get you Marlon Brando. I can get you Marlon Brando. Make me an offer now. Make me an offer. This is Marlon Brando after Godfather, last tango in Paris. So it is Marlon Brando at I think the culmination of his career, really. And my father, that's why obviously we made that movie, said, do it. But Marlon was the crystal that made this, the crystal, like in the film, that made this happen, okay? Because the moment Marlon Brando said yes, Gene Ackman wants to be in the picture, Warner Brothers very quickly said, we want the picture for you of the United States, pick up guarantee, and that was, the picture was on.